Hello, Two Rivers family. Good morning and welcome again to our online service. Um, glad to be here with you. Lindsay and I are grateful uh, to have an opportunity just to share um, just some words of encouragement and some pastoral uh, words of uh, strength for us uh, this morning as a welcome and as a call to worship for our service uh, today. The heartbeat of God has always been towards the oppressed and the marginalized, and Jesus brought this heart to earth. He changed everything. He tore down the walls of division and oppression, and he bridged the gap of disunity. And it is in Jesus that we are one. Galatians 3.28 tells us there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And church, I urge us as God's people into a time of prayer and supplication before the throne of God. This is a spiritual battle, you guys, and we have to face it that way. Racism, oppression, violence, hatred, this is the work of the enemy to destroy our lives, our unity, our brotherhood. Ephesians 6, 12 tells us, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, the, the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. If we don't face oppression and inequality through Jesus, someone will always end up oppressed. Jesus is the true equalizer, and there is no healing or hope apart from Christ. May we unite in Christ and bring heaven to this broken time. And as um, Pastor Chris Vallotton says, um, and I wanna echo his words, it's past time to pray, act, listen, and love the hell out of this nation. Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration in John chapter 17 um, prayed to his Father on behalf of all of uh, the disciples, the believers, the followers. And the prayer is this, I pray that they, which is us, that they would all be one, just as you and I are one. We know and believe and proclaim that Jesus came to fulfill the messianic prophecies to be the savior of the world, of all nations, of all races, of all people, period. And Paul says these words in Galatians 5, 1, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. And the us, the us there in Galatians 5, 1 is all of us. It is Jew and Gentile, it is male and female, it is slave and free. And I want to remind us this morning uh, that once us uh, Gentiles were the outsiders and Jesus came to fight for our freedom. And following Jesus means fighting for the freedom for all people and especially those who have been minimized, oppressed, and silenced. And so church family, we, we must uh, learn and grow and repent on behalf of our brothers and sisters of color. We must change by the kindness of the Lord. He leads us to repentance, which is to change. And we must begin uh, in a fresh way to ally and advocate for those who need our voice. Uh, silence and inaction in the face of any racism and any injustice is not, it is not where Jesus is going. And we are going with Jesus. Would you pray uh, with us um, this morning? Father, we bow our knee in humility before you. We need you. I pray that you would speak. I pray that we would listen. I pray that you would empower us as your children to bring change, Father. You are the redeemer, you are the hope, you are the healer, and it is in you, it is only in you that there will be change. And I just pray that as your children, that we would, um, that we would humble ourselves, Lord. And I just pray for reconciliation. I pray for healing. 
I just pray that we would be a light. And I just pray, Lord, that um, our church would be a voice, a voice for the minimized, Lord. I pray that we would stand in unity before you. We, we thank you, Father. We praise you in your name. Amen. Amen. So church, uh, with joy and with thanksgiving and with lament, let us worship the living God. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you, I want to see you, open the eyes of my heart, Lord, open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you. I want to see you. See you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power. I want to 
see the way you love those that I may not see. Lord, give me your eyes to see those around me, to love like you do, to love like you do. Because when it comes to the 99, you would leave and go find the one. Every time, every time, you would leave the 99. To go and find the one every time, every time, yeah. I want to see like you do, God. I want to love like you do, God. I want to leave my pride behind. Open my eyes, open my eyes. See you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power in love as we sing, holy, holy, holy. took a breath when I doubted Lord remind me I'm wonderfully made you're an artist and a potter I'm the canvas and the clay and you make all things work together for my future and for my good all things work together for your glory and for your name. There's a healing light just beyond walk through fire I see clearly now I know nothing has been wasted no failure or mistake you're an artist and a potter I'm the canvas and the clay and you make all things work together for my future and for my good, you make all things work together for your glory and for your name. When I doubt it, Lord, remind me I'm wonderfully made. You're an artist and a potter. I'm the canvas and the clay. I know nothing has been wasted, no failure or mistake. You're an artist and a potter. I'm the canvas and the clay. Yeah, when I doubt it, Lord, remind me I'm wonderfully made. You're an artist and a potter. I'm the canvas and the clay. And I know nothing has been wasted. No failure or mistake. Cause you're an artist and a potter. I'm the canvas and the clay. And you make all things work together for my future. 
Here I stand, high in surrender. I need you now. Oh, my heart. Lord, thank you for your grace that holds us now. It holds us today. It holds us here, whatever circumstance we're in. Your grace is big enough to hold us all. Thank you, God. I need that constant reminder that your grace is big enough for me. It's big enough for my mistakes. It's big enough for my failures. It's big enough for my pride. Thank you for your grace. Thank you. Amen. Would you turn in your Bibles now to Mark chapter 12? Uh, Mark 12, 1 to 12 will be... Uh, what we're going to look at uh, this morning as we continue this journey through the Gospel of Mark. But before we get there, I want us to uh, take a, a moment here at the beginning and think about uh, all the things that we've been talking about, processing together, learning about in Mark 11 over the last three weeks. Jesus is turning the old way, the old uh, systems, the old covenant of law. He is turning it upside down and he is removing it. Uh, from people's understanding of this is how uh, we relate uh, with God. Uh, he is revolutionizing how people are to understand uh, life uh, and God and life uh, with God in this new radical way. The old system, as we know over the last few weeks, was keeping many on the outside. We know that women were... Uh, removed from uh, the inner courts of the temple and they were in the outer courts and we know that Gentiles were removed uh, they were also in the outer courts and we know that if they pushed past the boundaries and the the walls that had been set up to keep them from being on the inside that that was under the penalty of death and so uh, as we interact with these passages in this narrative in Mark 11 and 12 uh, Israel and its leadership had become antithetical to the radical inclusion of God. I want to uh, take a few moments here and look at a messianic prophecy uh, from Isaiah chapter 56. Uh, Isaiah 56, 1. This is what uh, the Lord says to maintain justice and do what is Right, for my salvation is close at hand and my righteousness will soon be revealed. And we know and believe and proclaim that that righteousness has been fully revealed in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. 
but maintain justice, do what is right, for my salvation is close at hand and my righteousness will soon be revealed. Six verses down, uh, verse seven in Isaiah 56, which you may remember is a verse that Jesus quotes uh, in Jerusalem uh, at the temple from Mark chapter 11 when Jesus says it's when he goes into the outer courts and he's turning the tables over and he creates the, the whip and he's driving people out and he quotes Isaiah 56, 7, for my, hi, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. And if we pause here and we uh, did a really a, a deep dive into the ancient Hebrew language uh, that the Old Testament was written in, and we really wanted to understand more about uh, what it means all nations, what you're going to find is that what it means is all. It means all nations. The next verse Verse 8, Isaiah 56, the sovereign Lord declares, I will gather still others to them besides those already gathered. And I want to, I, I, I underlined it for you. You can see it on your screen. I want to emphasize that phrase, still others. I, it's something I want you to grab onto because that will be very relevant uh, to connect that to our text today for Mark chapter 12. Isaiah 56, it is a prophecy of the Messiah. It is a prophecy of the Savior of the world. It is a prophecy of the radical inclusion of the gospel of grace in Jesus. All nations, all tribes, all tongues, all races. It is so others-centered. All people have value. All people have honor. This is at the very heart of God. This is the prophecy that Jesus came to fulfill. And it's why we, uh, we, we, we saw in Mark 11, it's why he cursed that fig tree in Jericho and miraculously 24 hours later, it was withered down to its very roots, which was um, a symbol of the ending of the old temple sacrificial systems and the distinctions and the walls and the exclusion that was happening, uh, the exclusion in the temple, the gender exclusion, the ethnic exclusion, the social and religious inequality, all of that was all coming down and it was all going to wither away. It's why Jesus said in Mark 11 that if anyone says to this mountain, and we, we learned that what Jesus is talking about there, when he says this mountain, he's talking specifically to the Mount of Zion that the temple was built upon. And he says, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself, we're, we're removing this reality, go throw yourself in the sea. And he does not doubt, but believes the new way is about belief and faith but believes it will be done for him. The goodness of the gospel of Jesus and his marvelous grace is that all are invited, all are welcome, all matter, all have value, all nations. And as I consider these things from Isaiah 56 and I consider where we are in this journey through the gospel of Mark. And I, as I consider where we are uh, today in our country and the civil unrest that's happening, it feels honestly uh, quite providential uh, that this is where we are in our study in the gospel of Mark. And my call uh, to you as your pastor is we must look to Jesus. He is the author and he is the perfecter of our faith. We must look to Jesus to teach us. Uh, we must look to Jesus to, by his kindness, lead us to repentance. We must look to Jesus to, to lead us and change us uh, as we follow him in our lives. And as we seek as Christians, as followers of Jesus, to do the same that Isaiah 56 1 says, to maintain justice and to do what is right, uh, that we must look to Jesus. Uh, Jesus is, he is not a freedom fighter. Jesus is the freedom fighter that we follow. Luke chapter four, Jesus opens up the scroll of Isaiah 61. It's his first kind of like public uh, sermon, message. 
and he quotes Isaiah 61, I have come to proclaim freedom to the captives. I have been sent to set the oppressed free. Luke 15, Jesus leaves the 99 to go after, to initiate, to, to fight for, to, to find the one. John chapter 4, we see this interaction uh, with Jesus and a woman at the well in a place called Samaria. Samaria is just north of Judea where Jerusalem was. It was a region in Israel and Samaritans were hated by the Jews. It was very racial. It was a racial divide. And Jesus goes and he initiates a, a relationship, a conversation with this woman at Jacob's well. And he breaks down gender distinctions and racial distinctions and social divides in one big fell swoop. Jesus is the freedom fighter. He sees the lame and he heals them. The lame were the forgotten ones. They were the invisible ones. You might remember the story from Mark chapter two. The paralytic comes in with his four friends in Capernaum and they dig a hole in the roof and they lower Jesus or they lower their friend to the feet of Jesus in Peter's mother-in-law's home. And then Jesus heals him, but he also forgave him. It was a foreshadow of the radical reality of what Jesus was inaugurating in the new covenant. He forgave him bypassing all of the rules of forgiveness that was set up under the old covenant of law and under the traditions of all the religious elite. Mark chapter five, Jesus goes to a Gentile area on the east side. I'm looking in, in my mind to see of Galilee on the east side of the Sea of Galilee. It was a very oppressed, isolated, forgotten, cast out man. Um, the people of the town called him Legion. You might remember the story. But Jesus heals him and then Jesus empowers him to go be a missionary of the good news in his hometown. Uh, Mark 10, Bartimaeus, Jericho, Jesus sees this blind man and he heals him. And then Bartimaeus follows Jesus into Jerusalem. I could go on and on and on because these things happen over and over and over again in the ministry of Jesus because Jesus is the freedom fighter. That is who we follow. And as we get to Mark 12, Jesus's fight for freedom for all nations to be included is upsetting the establishment. It is um, uh, the, the, the power structures of the day are being pressed upon and they are getting very upset. And we should be reminded as Jesus is engaging these conversations uh, with the chief priests uh, and the teachers of the law and the elders and the Pharisees, we must be reminded that these, uh, these Jewish leaders, these religious leaders, they have the power to imprison Jesus. And they are used to control. They are used to exerting their control by fear. And they have the authority to oppress whomever they want. They make the rules and they keep the rules. And we know from last week's message in Mark 11, uh, they come to Jesus with this question, uh, by what authority are you doing these things? Uh, in other words, they come to Jesus and they say, who do you think you are? How dare you speak against this mountain, against this temple, against this system that we have here. How dare you speak against our ways, our oppressive ways. And we know from last week's uh, message that Jesus answers their question with a question and it perplexes them. He stumps them and they basically say to him, we don't know how to answer your question. And Jesus responds to them, I'm not going to answer your question. You're not gonna back me into any corner here. And then as we continue this narrative and this dialogue uh, in our text today, Jesus will answer their question with a parable, with a story. And the parable that we're gonna read today makes them angrier than they have ever been before. Uh, it is uh, getting quite serious in Jerusalem. It is getting quite serious in the temple. 
And Jesus is not and he will not back down in his fight for grace and for free forgiveness and the radical inclusion of all nations, of of all people who uh, would come when they are invited. So again, Mark 12, uh, we're going to look at uh, the first 12 verses, this parable, and I've entitled uh, this message to to others. This is the gospel. This is others centered. Would you read with me Mark 12, one, uh, verse 1 to 12. And he, Jesus, began to speak to them in parables. He's going to answer their question, who do you think you are? He's going to answer them with this parable. And here's the parable. A man planted a vineyard And he put a fence around it and he dug a pit for the wine press and he built a tower and he leased it to tenants. And then he went away to another country. And when the season came, he sent a servant to the tenants to get from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. And they, the tenants, and they took him and they beat him and they sent him away empty handed. And again, he sent them another servant and they struck him on the head and they treated him shamefully. And he sent another and they killed him. And so with many others, some they beat and some they killed. He still had one other, a beloved son. And finally, he sent him to them saying, they will respect my son. But those tenants said to one another, this is the heir. Come and let us kill him and the inheritance will be ours. And they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. What will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. Have you not read this scripture? And Jesus is going to quote Psalm 118. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone or the capstone. This was the Lord's doing. This invitation to give everything to others. This, this, is, this was the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes. Verse 12 And they, the religious leaders, they were seeking to arrest him, but they feared the people, for they perceived that he had told the parable against them. And so they left him, and they went away, and they began to conspire on how they would kill Jesus. Um, This is what we want to spend the rest of our time uh, talking about this morning. I, I want to uh, invite you to write down Isaiah chapter 5. Uh, go and read that later and compare this parable in Mark 12 to Isaiah chapter 5 because Isaiah chapter 5 is all about a vineyard. Uh, there's a wall there and there's a watchtower and there's a wine press and what you're going to see is the same language that Jesus is using in Mark 12 in this parable and the prophecy that Isaiah gives us in Isaiah 5. I want to just read one verse with you, verse 7 of Isaiah 5. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the nation of Israel, and the people of Judah, and the people of Judah are the vines that he delighted in. And he looked for justice. The Lord Almighty looked for justice, but he saw bloodshed. He looked for righteousness, but he heard cries of distress. Again, so providential uh, that this is where we are uh, today uh, in our lives and in uh, our journey and in the reality of the civil unrest that's happening in our country. I, I, I have no doubt that Jesus had Isaiah chapter 5 in mind when he speaks this parable against the religious rulers and leaders. And he punches them right in the gut 
with it. Remember, they're asking him, who do you think you are? By what authority are you doing this? And Jesus offers this parable. That, it was the straw that broke the camel's back. Everything would start moving into motion toward Calvary and the cross of Jesus after this. Jesus to this crew, this, this congregation of all of these religious leaders, he tells this parable and he basically says, my own paraphrase, you are not in control, you are murderers and oppressors. You are the tenants, you are the tenants. And this mountain, this mountain, this temple reality, this is all coming down, whether you like it or not. I want to ask you a couple of questions. As we think about this parable, as we think about uh, the words that Jesus spoke here in Mark 12, a couple of questions for us to think about. Is, is God the owner? Or are the tenants the owners? Perhaps another way to ask that question, is there a God? Do we believe that there is a God who is sovereign and in authority, who is in control, or do we believe that tenants are in control? One of the things that I think is really important for us as we uh, read parables is to uh, think about who the characters are in the story. And so I want to point out uh, to you who the characters are in this, story, in this story, in this parable. The owner, obviously, is God himself. He is the owner of the vineyard. The tenants is Israel, the religious leaders that Jesus is speaking against. They are the tenants. The messengers, the servants that the owner that God was sending are the prophets. And the son, obviously, is the son of God, Jesus. As we heard in the story uh, the owner was sending the servants to uh, collect rent and the rent was the fruit of the vineyard the tenants uh, owed their rent and their rent uh, was the fruit but they had no fruit um, and every time the messengers came uh, they couldn't and they wouldn't pay the rent instead they uh, beat up the messengers or they killed the messengers and not only would they not pay the rent of fruit from the vineyard, they were hell-bent on stealing the inheritance by killing the son. And the owner is ready to enact his divine justice on the evil of the tenant's behavior. I want us to be clear as we think about this parable this parable is not about you and I becoming better tenants, becoming uh, better at uh, tending to what God has given us. That's not what this parable is about. It's not about you and I thinking about how we do better as tenants. This is about a radical new way of thinking about what it means to know God and follow Jesus. This parable is all about the radical new covenant of grace, the radical reality of grace and freedom. There's another character or other characters in this story that I wanna make sure that we are understanding as well. Who are we in the story? We're not the tenants. Israel and its uh, evil, uh, oppressive religious leadership, those are the tenants. Who are we in this story? Uh, we are the fifth category of characters in the story and it's found in verse nine. And he will give the vineyard to others. Others. That's us. That's me. That's you. That's who we are. We are the us. Those who are in Christ, those who are believing the message of grace and following Jesus as a disciple of Christ. We, we aren't the tenants. We are the sons and the daughters of God, and we have been given everything. The tenants wanted to kill the son and steal the inheritance. What we have been given as the others is we have been given everything. 
we are co-heirs with Christ, Paul tells us in Romans chapter 8. We have been blessed. We have been given everything to be blessed and to be a blessing. We uh, are, are not required to pay rent because we are not tenants. So we're not called to pay rent with fruit. We are called to abide and follow Jesus and to bear fruit. I'm making a distinction between paying rent with fruit and bearing fruit in our lives as we abide in Jesus and follow him. Uh, this language about a vineyard and abiding is uh, also in John chapter 15, as most of you probably know, verse one, uh, I am the true vine, Jesus tells the disciples, and my father is the gardener. Then in verse five, I am the vine, you, again, to others, that's us, uh, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit for apart from me, you can do nothing. So we think about fruit and just uh, a vineyard and a vine. Uh, fruit is a natural response of being attached to a vine. Fruit isn't something that, that we work hard to produce. It's actually produced as we rest and abide in Jesus. It, it flows out of our lives naturally. A true spiritual fruit will begin to show up in my life and in your life as we come to know who Jesus is and we follow where he is going. Galatians chapter five, the fruit of the spirit. It is love, it is joy, it is peace, it is patience, it is kindness, it is goodness, it is faithfulness, it is gentleness, it is self-control. These things start to show up in our lives. We bear much fruit as we abide in Jesus. First Corinthians chapter 13, really it's a description of what God's love is like. Uh, and it will describe us as well um, if we are going and growing in Jesus. But I want you to hear a uh, popular, famous passage. I want you to hear how God's love is described. Love is patient and kind. It does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things. God, his love, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends or love never ends fails. These things begin to show up in our lives as fruit as we know God and as we follow the gospel of grace that is in Jesus. One more passage that I want to read over you, Philippians chapter 2. This is the fruit that shows up in our lives as we know Jesus and follow Jesus as he has come to fulfill the prophecy to be a savior to the world and all nations. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from his love, if there is any participation in the spirit, if there is any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same Love, being in full accord and of one mind. This is about unity in Jesus. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others. There's the word. Count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. The tenants in the story, selfish, power hungry, oppressive, literally murdering to steal an inheritance for themselves. This is not the way of Jesus. This is not who we are in Christ. This is not the identity that Jesus has given to us. This is not what it looks like, sounds like, feels like to know Jesus and follow him. We are the others. 
We are on the receiving end of God's marvelous grace. And now we have been given an empowerment to be conduits of that grace and freedom to all nations, all peoples. Jesus is inviting us in humility to receive the abundance of his grace and the free gift of his righteousness. He is saying, I am giving it to you. The vineyard is yours. The Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes. The stone that is the capstone or the cornerstone, it is Jesus. And it will either crush you or you can build your life on top of it. You can die like a tenant or you can live like a son or daughter of the Most High King. I believe that this message, the grace bomb, if you will, of this message is that phrase in verse nine, to others. And Jesus is saying, I have come to pay the rent for everyone and to release everyone from his or her debt. And the mountain of the law, the mountain of religion, the mountain of rules, the mountain of oppression, the mountain of creating distinctions and divides based on gender or ethnic reality or socioeconomic reality or any of those things that that the world would tell us to build walls around. All those things are coming down. The mountain is over. It is all withered and gone and it is being cast into the sea by faith. The way of grace and love has come. And so my prayer and my pastoral uh, exhortation and call to all of us is to remain attached to the vine. Jesus is the vine. And as we stay connected to Jesus, as we listen to Jesus, as we we follow Jesus, your fruit, my fruit, our fruit, will, it will be love. It will be love. I am the other branch that has been grafted in. I am loved. I'm the beloved of God. And you, you are the other branch that has also been grafted in. You are on the outside, but now you have been invited to the inside and the wall of hostility that has been the great divide has been removed and Jesus himself is our peace. You are loved. You are the beloved of God. All, all of you. My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. Isaiah 56, 7, Jesus quotes it again in Mark 11. The sovereign Lord declares, I will gather still others to them besides those already gathered. And there is room for more at the banquet table of the grace of God in Jesus. And still others need to know and be invited and welcomed and to hear the proclamation of the good news of the grace and freedom of Jesus. Still others, still others need to be cared for and seen and valued and honored and fought for and be welcomed. Loved people are called to love all people. Blessed people, and we are blessed. We have been given everything in Jesus. Blessed people are called to bless all people, to maintain justice and to fight and do what is right and good that honors the name of Jesus. Freed people are called to go and to free all people in the way of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Again, proclaiming the gospel of good news, which is liberty to the captives and liberty to all who are oppressed. Church, we have work to do. And it is an important work. 
It is the work of God himself. It is the work of heaven. And so I pray heaven to earth and I pray that we would be conduits of heaven's work in us and through us. So let us be strong and courageous. Let us not tremble or be dismayed for the Lord our God is with us wherever we go as we continue to follow Jesus as the freedom fighter. Let's pray together. Lord, we want to see you. We want to know you. We want to follow you. And Lord, we, we need to see more clearly. And we need your kindness to lead us to a fresh repentance, to change, to grow, to learn, to be a freedom fighter like you for all nations. And so I pray, Lord, that uh, your spirit would stir in us uh, again, a renew, a renewing of our mind and, re and a renewing of our passion and our purpose to be light and salt, to be humble servants, to initiate, to engage, to maintain justice, to seek and do what is right in the name of Jesus. Would you uh, show us yourself in a fresh way? Would you give us wisdom? Would we operate in faith? Would we be strong and courageous as we join you in caring and serving and loving and fighting for captives and those who are still oppressed and proclaiming the gospel to still others so that every tribe and tongue, that all nations would truly have an opportunity to hear the gospel and respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is in your name we pray, amen. Important things really important things uh, for us uh, to know uh, and to walk in in these days. As we sing this last song, we uh, encourage you to uh, receive communion. Uh, if you are in your home, if you have gathered organically with other friends and family uh, in our church, we encourage you to take communion together during this last song. And as you're stirred in worship, in gratitude and joy to be a part of this vision and mission, uh, we uh, invite your offerings. Uh, our commitment to you is to be a steward of your offerings, your free will offerings, so that we can continue uh, to fight for the freedom of all nations, not just here in Fort Collins, but around the world. Let's sing and worship together. children tell the children let this be their memory all oh, my treasure was in heaven and you were everything to me no one ever cared for Jesus, his faithful and his help me all this way. When I'm old and gray, all my days are numbered on the earth. Let it be known, 
Hey, church, thanks for joining us today. We miss you, and we are so eager to be together. Pray for our leadership team. We are really trying to find out the best way to get back together in person, and so we need the wisdom to figure out when that is. Uh, but we will let you know as soon as we do, and we can't wait to see you. Have a great day. Bye.